take your time and do a good job. That's what we would always rather do. But so we want to focus today on how it is we got to the place we're at in terms of knowledge. So how is it that we know what we know? And today, I remembered my cheat sheet. Look at that. All right. So let's quickly get in this then. So in a single night, if you just look up, um, does anyone do any, is, do we have any photographers in the room? Anyone love to take photos? Nice, I love it. Anyone ever done any astrophotography? Like, it's a cool thing. But, well, you can actually get apps for your phone that will let you do that. But like with this camera here, which is a very simple camera, this is nothing too fancy, but you can set this to do long exposures. So I could actually set it up and say, make a very small, small, small aperture in the lens. So very little light gets in. And I could actually say, we're gonna go outside and this is gonna expose light for a whole five hours or 10 hours. And it'll just take one photograph that'll take that long. Um, and that is what this is right here. This is a single photograph where light was let into the camera for just hours and hours. The cool thing is, it makes it look like that mist at the bottom of the mountain is all daytime. It's not. This is all taken at nighttime. But the camera was just open for so long that, uh, that there was enough light over time to make that mist and to make the mountain and to make the road look like daytime exposure. Yeah. This kind of looks like a Photoshop version of Starry Night, where if someone tried to like recreate it, but like <laughs> modern. Yeah, interestingly. It does, doesn't it? And yet, this is not a Photoshop job. This yeah. is actually a single exposure, which is kind of cool. And what you notice is that the stars, over the course of a few hours, appear to make spinning trails. By the way, there's one star that mostly doesn't. This star right here. What star is that? What star is right there? Nope. Nope, the sun would look a lot brighter than that. We wouldn't see the other stars if the sun were in the sky. Good thinking, though. And the sun does move, right? You know that. Over the course of a day, the sun goes, boo, it doesn't stay in one place. It moves. Is it the northern star? It is the northern star. See, because of the way the Earth spins, as the Earth spins, the stars appear to move, right? Because if there's a star right here, boom, I'm moving by it. But if there's a star directly above the North Pole, well, even as we spin, does it appear to be changing where it is? No, it's right in line. So the North Star is so-called because it just happens to be directly above the North Pole. Interestingly, um, every 30,000 years or so, Earth actually wobbles a bit on its axis like this, still the result of that same impact with Thea that formed our moon. And so what is the North Star right now? A few thousand years from now actually won't be the North Star. It'll be offset from the North Pole and it will move just like the others. Sometimes there is no North Star. If there happens to be no star above there, then there's no star that doesn't move. We just happen to be alive at a time when there's a star that's lined up perfectly with the northern pole of our axis. And it stays in place. Now, we can show this really easily in modern times by taking a camera and exposing like this. But for thousands of years, for thousands of years, People have been able to look up at the night sky and track where the stars move over the course of a night. And they have known about this phenomenon. Um, so we talked about that. We talked about how um, in ancient times they named all of the, uh, what we call the signs of the zodiac. But really these are just the stars that become visible, right? Um, on May 21st, you begin to see Taurus for the first time because it's on the night side of the planet. And then by April, you'll see Aries. And then by March, you'll see Pisces. And, you know, I should be going in the proper order. By June, you see Gemini. Then July, Cancer. By August, Leo. And so on and so forth. And so they named these signs of the zodiac after the stars as they begin to be apparent. But really quickly, and I don't want to write anything for this, but we'll get down to this. The ancients, people who were alive years ago, were able to observe things, and they were able to figure things out about our planet. And we have writings that go back thousands of years where they know that the Earth is round. Um, we have writings that go back thousands of years that say 
the Earth rotates on its axis. We have writings that go back thousands of years that say the Earth is revolving around the sun. We have writings that go back thousands of years that saying the stars must be points of light that are far distant outside of us. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the, they knew that the Earth was round. Uh, it was actually common knowledge that the Earth was round when Christopher yes. Columbus actually. Yes. Oh, yes. The this myth that this is just something that was discovered in recent times doesn't match with history. So, to get to start to get into it, something as simple as how did people 2,500 years ago know that the Earth was a sphere, that we were not sitting on top of a flat plane, but we were sitting on top of a sphere. And, you know, there's a few reasons that have been written down over time, but there's two that come to mind, two that I think are worth mentioning. One is seen here. What is this a photo of? Because I find this endlessly fascinating. What am I looking at? It is a boat. And we are looking through a telescope at a boat way, 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 way in the distance. And what are we seeing? Does it look like a boat? Yeah. See, the problem is the boaty part is down here, isn't it? Why can't I see it? Is this boat sinking? This is not a boat that's sinking, I promise. It's going around the Earth's curvature. Good, very good. See, here's the problem. If the Earth was flat, and there's water on the Earth, and there's a boat here, and I am here, if I'm looking through my telescope, I should see the boat, right? But that's not what we see. That isn't what we see. And as long ago as thousands of years ago, they understood that that's not what we see. Because if you're only seeing what's there, what might happen is this. If I'm here, and I'm looking through my telescope like this, well, what happens if the boat is actually over here? Can I see the base of the boat? No. Because I can't see through the Earth. So all I can see at the beginning is the masthead of the boat. Does that make sense? That explains this phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, Crystal Beach, uh, from some places, like there's like the houses, and then it's like behind them is literally just the sea or the lake or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really weird to look at because you can see like behind it, and if you're standing a little bit further away from the water, it almost looks like it's going above the houses. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you get all kinds of crazy effects there. But so this simple phenomenon right there, we just want to talk about how it is we learn things. So for example, a ship in the distance becomes visible top down. And you might just, if you're the you know, you, somebody, a lot of people, I'm sure, would have just seen that and said, okay, well, that's how it happens. But good scientific thinking, and good scientific thinking has been around a long time, led people to make an inference. Do you know what it means to infer something? To uh, summarize and... Um, it's related to that, for sure. It's definitely... Yeah, related to that as well. These are we're getting there. It's an educated guess based on what you've seen. Yeah, I like that. I, I, all you put all the three of those together, and I think we've got it. An inference means to look at the information you have there, to gather it and kind of collect it, and to look at the parts of it that we can't see and say, okay, what might this mean? I've observed this. I infer. I figure out what the meaning of that might be. That the Earth must be, the Earth must be round. Okay, now, so that piece of information and other pieces of information, um, is useful. Now, here's another thing. Okay, so now we know the Earth is round. And the fact that over the course of night, the stars appear to spin gives us some information. But here's a neat thing. Here's something else that was observed. Um, Moving distances north or south <coughs> reveals brand new stars. But 
moving east or west only changes the time that stars appears. You could go on an easterly direction and travel all the way around the world. You will never see a different star in the sky than the ones you see right now. You'll see all the exact same stars. Interestingly, you'll see them at different times. Right? Like, right now, a star that appears at midnight, if you went to Calgary, you're going to see that star appearing later on. It won't appear until maybe, you know, 2, 3 a.m. Isn't that the time zones? Yeah, interestingly, if you count for the time zone, it'll appear at the exact same time. But we won't worry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, they appear at different times. But if you start moving south, if you go down to Florida, you'll start seeing some new stars on the horizon that you just don't ever see up here. And if you make it all the way to the southern hemisphere, you can go far enough that not only will you see new stars, all the stars you're used to seeing will disappear. They'll no longer be in the sky, and they'll never be there. doesn't matter what time of year you go. So moving north or south gives us brand new stars. And what we realize is that the Earth, I'm going to go back to that, so don't worry. The Earth, because it's always spinning this way, um, if you're in the north, you're always going to be able to see at some point any star that's in the north, but you can't see through the planet, so you won't see the stars that are in the south. So what they could infer is that the Earth must rotate east to west. Knowing that the Earth is a sphere that rotates isn't some modern thing. This is what makes it so horrifically sad and depressing when you hear these like flat earther people who are so <laughs> up in their own heads. It, like, it's not something to be disgusted by or angry about, but it's profoundly sad because they've chosen to latch on to some nonsense, but something that has been settled for 3,000 years. You know, pick a new fight. Um, but, uh, and I mean, the, the, the sort of conspiracy theory and sort of the, the culture of, you know, I know something nobody else knows can be a sad thing because what I find really interesting is that there's a, so many scientific discoveries to be made and scientific discoveries aren't just made by scientists. They're made by everyday people too. But you don't want to spend your time obsessing about things that are long since discovered. This stuff well-established. Very basic observations get us here, and we have these things in writing thousands of years ago, and we know they're true because people have been using them to... Ah, are you here for the Xbox Cube? Well, I like my case. guys in my class that are bragging about the computers they built, and I'm like, well, hold on a sec, guys. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I really like the Cube case. I wasn't sure at first. I think it's Amazing. Actually. Yeah, when I first heard it, they said mini case, and it came, I'm like, that's not that mini. It's awesome. But the more I've had it, the more I've liked it. Are you giving that to me? I can't remember who it was. I don't think you are, but do you want me to hand it into the office? You know what? I've got a pile to take down anyway, yeah. so if you want to stick it right here, I, yeah, can, yeah. I can get that. Yeah, well, I'll take a picture, because uh, it's dead. <laughs> you haven't seen anything yet, dude. Love it. Hold on. So... And here's the thing, in case you think like, well, you know, people have a theory or whatever, here's the great thing, is that not only have people been doing, knowing this for thousands of years, but by knowing where the stars should be, they could navigate. The reason a ship can go out on the ocean and get somewhere before you have GPS is they learned how to know where the stars should be and to compare that to where you see them to use that to tell you where you are. By the way, even to this day, if you're gonna be a sailor or a pilot, they still train you how to do that. Because if the computers go down, you still got to be able to figure out where you are. Yeah. They actually mention that in the movie Moana when they're on the ocean. Dude, that's so true. Yeah. And I mean, if you, to this day, um, I took sailing lessons with another teacher here, a guy named Mark Schantz, but to this day, they teach you how to read a sextant, which is a device that, dirty sounding name aside, you actually use to look at and you can pick a star in the sky and know where it should be and you can measure the angles above the horizon and you can get a chart out and you can figure out on an atlas where you are by looking at the stars or looking at the sun at the time of day, yeah. Uh, why can the sun be in front of the clouds? You know, those... Uh, those Not in front, just, uh, just bright enough that you can shine right through it. 
right? The same, the same reason that if, uh, if we filled this room up with fog so that I couldn't see you, if I put a spotlight behind it, I'd still see the spotlight. You know, just, just basic, uh, just basic the fact that just because something has enough density to diffuse or to stop diffuse light, light that's bouncing around, the direct light of the sun just is much more high energy. So now, not only did we know that the Earth is round, but in the year 280 BC, a Greek mathematician, a guy named Aristarchus, determined the Earth revolved around the sun. Pretty impressive. And, and he figured out the distance. He actually estimated the distance from the Earth to the sun. And I'm not going to get too much into it because it's a lot of math, but he did geometry. What's geometry? Shapes. Yeah, he worked with shapes. So he did geometry to prove the moon was much smaller than the sun. Oh, he looks good. Never mind. So this is really cool. I don't want to get too much into it, but do you know how he figured out how much bigger the sun was than the moon? This is really cool. He waited for an event that happens a couple times a year, reliably, which is when a couple times a year does the moon and the sun interact? Solar. Eclipses, good. And not a solar eclipse, but a lunar eclipse, where the, the sun casts a shadow of the Earth over the moon. And so the cool thing was, by timing how long the eclipse lasted um, for both solar eclipses and lunar eclipses, he was able to work out the ratios of what the relative size of the moon, the earth, and the sun must be, and how far apart they must be. Isn't that incredible? Just did the geometry, just did the math. Said, okay, when the, sun, when the moon casts a shadow on the earth, we can time how long it takes for that to pass by. When the earth casts a shadow on the moon, we can time how long it takes for that to pass by and we can figure out how big the three things must be relative to each other and how far apart they must be. Yeah? Um, if you were on the moon during a lunar eclipse, would it, would it just be pitch black or would there still be light? Um, okay, during a lunar eclipse is when the sun casts a shadow on the moon. So it wouldn't be, it would be like nighttime for them. Okay. So it would be, it, they would experience, keep in mind for them, a lunar eclipse, I mean them, there's nobody there, but if there were, a lunar eclipse to them is like what a solar eclipse is to us, which is to say it's something going in front of the sun. But here's the difference. When the moon goes in front of the sun, the moon and the sun are basically the same size, right? So we see that kind of thing famously where the sun starts to kind of like crescent, 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 crescent. But the earth, from the moon, the earth is much, much bigger than the sun. So it can just go in front of that thing and just spend a whole bunch of time there blocking it out. So the only thing that's different about it is that the, sun, the earth that would block the sun on the moon is much, much bigger, and it would take quite a bit of time for it to move right by. Whereas there's this, just by trick of accident, the sun is about 30 times bigger than the moon, all right? And it's about 30 times farther away, which if you've never noticed this, take a look next time. If you go out and don't stare right at it, but take a look at the sun, and the sun is usually about, if you hold your pinky finger at arm's length, your sun, the, sun, the sun is about the size of your fingernail of your pinky finger at about arm's length. Can you kind of do that? Hold that out. Come on. Come on, you got hands. Yeah, yeah. So picture that fingernail, pinky fingernail. That's about how big the sun appears in the sky. The moon appears to be about that exact same size. Our moon and our sun in the sky are just about perfectly the same size. That's just random chance because the sun is about 30 times bigger and it's about 30 times further away. So they appear to be about the same size. So he basically, he is able to figure out that this is the basic layout of the solar system. Keep in mind, 2,300 years ago, that we have the Earth, we have the Moon, and we have the Sun, and he figures out the relative distances and the relative sizes. Now, when I say relative sizes, like I said, what he figures out is that the sun is about 30 times bigger than the, than the moon, and uh, so on and so forth, but it's all relative to one another. What would you have to do to know, not just that the sun is bigger than the earth, but to actually know, well, how do we know, does anyone know how big the earth is? Does anyone know how big it is from one side of the earth to the other? Not that we can, but if I was going to start digging a hole straight down, 
How far would I have to dig before I came out the other side? I mean, I understand that the answer is that I would be burned to death by magma or crushed to death by the gravity at the core of it. But assuming none of that happened, how far would I have to go? Uh, over 3,000 miles. Yeah, it's about 6,800 kilometers. Six, about 6,800 kilometers from one side of the Earth to the other. It's a big old place, right? How do we know that? I mean, we've now taken photos of the Earth. But what's crazy is um, a guy named Aristophanes actually came up with a measurement in 240 BC. In 240 BC. And the crazy thing is he was pretty close to right. And listen, we're just kind of breezing through these. Do I expect you to be able to recreate this experiment? No. But I want to give you the idea that basically he, Aristophanes said, if the Earth is in fact a sphere, which was well understood at this point, um, if I was deep down in a well, um, would I be able to see the sun from the bottom of the well if it was, you know, just kind of over there in the sky? If you picture being down in a well, when's the only time you're going to see the sun up there? Only when it is right overhead. Does that make sense? So he kind of does this thought experiment, and then, as often happens, he kind of goes a step further and says, well, forget a thought experiment. What if I actually did this? And so he does. He goes down into a well, and sure enough, at a certain point during the day, perfectly at noon, uh, he can see the sun in the sky. Great. So he says, well, if the Earth is actually a sphere, a few towns over, if we have a tower, will the sun be directly overhead of that tower if the Earth is curved? I mean, obviously, I've drawn this exaggeratedly, but here, in my town, the sun is directly overhead. In this town, the sun actually isn't overhead, and it's going to cast a shadow. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So he says, well, wait a minute. We can actually do some math here. If I know the distance between the well and the tower, and if I know how long the shadow is, I can start doing some geometry. Does that make sense? So he says, we, we need to come up with a way. Maybe we'll use like an hourglass and we will both do this at the exact moment that, you know, the, uh, the last grain comes down. But if we know exactly when the sun is right overhead here, and if we can measure the shadow there, we can actually extend that and we can figure out the radius of the Earth with some actually pretty simple geometry. Would you know how to do this in grade 9 math? No. Um, but by the time you get to grade 11 math, you would know, have enough math to know how to do this with some pretty simple geometry. So we'll write this. So by measuring the difference in angle, of the sun at the same time in different places um, our pal Aristophanes which I'm not going to attempt to spell again um, he was able to calculate the radius of the earth and you want to know the crazy thing he pretty much nailed it. Um, we don't know exactly um, what his measurement was because we don't know exactly what his unit meant. He measured it in something called cubits, and we don't know exactly how much a cubit was. But we have some guesses based on them talking about how many cubits tall people were and how many cubits tall people's horses were that we know that he was roughly correct. We don't know how exactly correct because we don't even know how big a cubit was exactly. But he was able to pretty accurately calculate the radius of the Earth. This is 2,260 years ago. 2,260 years ago. No computers, no internet, no satellites, no, uh, no space stations, no telescopes. Just measuring shadows. Able to calculate the radius of the Earth. Pretty incredible stuff. Yeah. Oh, wouldn't you like to know? Never mind. Yeah, we want to know. I have fallen asleep 
three times in my teaching oh. career. I'm ashamed of each of them, but I'm teaching a class right now. I'm trying to stay awake. All right. So again, listen, I don't care that you have this memorized to know this. What I want to get across, what I really want to get across is that just by opening our eyes to the world around us, we can learn incredible volumes of information. Does that make sense? Just by looking at shadows on the ground, this guy is able to say, hey, I wonder if I could figure out how big the Earth is, and he did it. Um, this leads us to, we're going to go later on, this leads us to a guy named Ptolemy. And, this, and he does look an awful lot like Lord Farquaad. Um, but this is actually not Ptolemy. This is Copernicus. Uh, we're going to talk about him in a minute. Copernicus. But I want to talk about something. I want to talk about the danger of bad ideas. The danger of bad ideas. Which is in 85 AD, we have, and this he is not the first person to think this, nor the last, but we get a Greek philosopher named Ptolemy who comes up with the idea of a geocentric universe. What's geocentric mean? Geo means... Geography means Earth. Centric means center. He comes up with the idea of a universe with the Earth at the... Center. Yeah, the Earth at the center. And something bad happens. And this is something worth remembering. This is really important. If you take nothing else away from my class, take this away. It's that we are naturally arrogant and stupid, every one of us. You are, I am, Ptolemy was, and so is Copernicus, and so are your parents, and so are your aunts and your uncles, and so is everyone on YouTube and Facebook and Snapchat, whatever the hell that is. All these things, we are all naturally swayed by bad ideas. And a great point in this is that as a culture, we have the ability to lose knowledge. It happens. It has happened throughout human history that we have something figured out and then people get lazy with it and they don't care about expanding their knowledge and we can be swayed by bad ideas. This is an example of a bad idea that takes hold for about 1,500 years. And listen, there were always people in culture who knew what was known previously, that the Earth was spherical, that it revolved around the sun, that all these things. But in popular culture, bad ideas take sway. Right? And you call it fake news, you can call it whatever you want, but we are naturally predisposed to be told something that isn't true. And not only do we believe it, but here's the crazy thing. Every study shows that if you take somebody who doesn't believe in climate change, you know, despite the fact that there's overwhelming evidence for human-caused climate change, the sad thing is all the evidence tells us that the more information you give that person, the less they will believe you. If you take somebody who doesn't believe in vaccinations, all the evidence shows that the more proof you give them that vaccinations are good, the more likely they are to say no, they're bad. Humans naturally, and we all, you can't just assume it's other people. You have to know that you are like that. We all have a disposition to start believing wrong things. And then because we're arrogant and because we have big egos, when people tell us we're wrong, we like to dig our heels in and say, no, I'm not. And it's dangerous. It's dangerous. As a culture, we have to be open to good ideas, and we have to be open to being corrected when we're wrong. Ptolemy gave us a bad idea, not because he was an evil guy, not because he was stupid, but because he was wrong about something. But his idea took hold, and for almost 1,500 years, that was the dominant idea, and we couldn't shake it. People were put in jail because they said they were wrong. So... Ptolemy tells us that the Earth is the center of the universe, and this holds on until a guy named Copernicus comes around. And in 1543 AD, Copernicus observed, as some other astronomers had, this strange thing called the retrograde motion of the planets. All right? So first, let's talk about planets. Um, way back 2,000 years ago, we knew that there were some dots in the sky that were called stars, and other dots that were called planets. What's the difference between the two? Well, stars don't move relative to one another. This is why we can have things called constellations. If you look at the Big Dipper, you know, that looks kind of like this. 
that collection of stars may move in the sky, but they all move together. Does that make sense? And any time of day, any time of night, any time of the year, if you can see those stars, they're going to be in the same shape. Because while they all move, stars are far enough away that they all move together. All right? No different than if you look way at like the Toronto skyline across the water or whatever. It may move, but it all moves together because it's far away. But the planets, the planets move through the night sky. And that's because they're revolving around the Earth just like we are. So on March 1st, Mars might look here near the Big Dipper. Mars will never be near the Big Dipper because they're on different sides of the sky. But that's okay. Don't worry about that. So Mars might be here, and then the next day it's here. And then the day after that it's here. And the day after that it's here. All the other stars move together, but night after night, Mars starts to move relative to the other stars. Does that make sense? So way back, 5,000 years ago, they knew the difference between the stars and the planets. They didn't know what planets were, they didn't know what stars were, but they knew that they were different. Does that make sense? Now, if, if Ptolemy was right, and the Earth was the center of the universe, then it is not hard to think that if this is the Earth, the planets are just revolving around it like this, right? And the sun is just one of those things that's revolving around us like that. No problem. Makes perfect sense, right? This is what Ptolemy thinks. All right? But if that's true, what should happen is if I look out, Mars, one night it should be here in the sky. Next night it should be here in the sky. The night after that, like that. The night after that, like that. The night after that, like that. Like that, like that. And that should be invisible for a while while it passes underneath us, right? And that should come back, and it should follow the same path. If it's revolving around us, that's what I should see, right? The problem is, that's not what you see. Copernicus, and he's not the first person to see this, but he's the first person to notice it or explain it, is that if you actually watch Mars, Mars, night after night, goes across the sky, 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 and then it seems to turn back on itself, and it moves backwards. Now, if Mars is actually revolving around us, that only makes sense if Mars is going, hey, oh, whoa, oh, oh, let's go this way, oh, let's go that way, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? That's not how things revolve. So this only makes sense if what is actually happening is there is the sun, the Earth is revolving around it like this, and Mars is revolving around it like that. And when it appears to go backwards, it's because we are overtaking Mars. We're moving faster than it when we come close to each other like this. Does that kind of make sense? There's a video that I'll throw up about that after. But so, the retrograde motion of Mars only makes sense if both Mars and Earth are revolving around something else. And in this case, we know what the thing we're revolving around is. It's the Sun. Otherwise, you have to imagine that Mars is out in space, and every once in a while it decides to turn around and go the other direction. And that just doesn't seem to fit. So this is what Copernicus gives us. Again, he doesn't have, you know, he's not sending probes out to watch how these things move. He's not making any observations. He's just looking at things in the night sky. He's tracking them. He's seen things that people have seen a million times before but he's thinking about them in a way that forces him to answer questions. Um, normally, I spend a bunch of days on all these guys, and you guys do some research projects and things like that. I just don't have the time. I wish I did, because um, this stuff is super interesting, and it's a lot less interesting when it's just me up here blabbering about it. But that's what you're stuck with, so you're going to have to live with it. So 
Copernicus, this seems like a really basic idea to us, but again, because of the sway of bad ideas, it was really unpopular. He got in a lot of trouble for posting this. Um, Copernicus, uh, you know, he was a controversial guy. Even more controversial, this is someone you may have heard of. Have you heard of Galileo? Yeah. Famous, famous scientist, discovered a lot of things. Um, responsible for one of our first theories of gravity. He famously, he's the guy who dropped, you know, different, uh, different balls off the uh, Leaning Tower of Pisa. Um, and determined that gravity didn't depend on the mass of the object. Big discovery, yeah. It's also a lyric multiple times in Living Veracity. This is true. <laughs> right, right up there with Figaro. Mm -hmm. So Galileo, and this is true, his name is Galileo Galilei. I think more people should go that way. Like I should just be Joseph Josephi or something. I think it would be good. Anyway, Galileo Galilei is this famous scientist, and he did a bunch of things. But one thing of note is he was a bit of a, uh, a builder, and he was an early builder, one of the first people to build a telescope. Not the first, but you know the telescope was something that had been invented, and Galileo built his own, as people did. There wasn't a shop you could go to and buy them, so he built one. Um, but at the time, what were telescopes mostly used for? Living what, though? Like, think, you know, practical purposes. You live in 1609. Who might be using telescopes? Yeah, that's a big one, right? Like, if this is going to be used for people on ships to see other ships. We talked about that earlier, right? They might be used on watchtowers to see armies approaching or things like that. But Galileo says, well, wait a minute. What else could I look at under this? I could look up, look up at the sky. And he does. So. He builds a telescope and he starts making observations. And one of the things he observes is what he calls the Milky Way. All right, which is, I guess, a, it's a pretty stupid name, but it's a, as good a name as any. So um, Galileo observes the stars of the Milky Way. You see, it is easy. Uh, does anyone have like a cottage they go to, or a camp they go to, or a campsite they go to, where at nighttime you can really see the Milky Way? You can really just see like our galaxy come overhead. If you don't ever get a chance to escape like city noise, light pollution, if you go up, if you go up nice up north where the air is nice and crisp and uh, there's not a lot of light, you can totally see the Milky Way there, and it really does just look kind of like this colorful cloud of stars. Yeah. You wrote Mikey Way. Did I? That's a guitarist. Yeah, Mikey Mikey Way. There we go. The Mikey Way is the better way. I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, the Milky Way also looks like a splash of milk. There you go. Kind of the name, right? But he sees... Galactic galaxy. He sees the individual stars, right? Because looking through his telescope, he can see that, you know, this kind of haze of light up there is in fact just stars upon stars upon stars. What we now know is the reason we see the Milky Way is that we are on the edge of a disc-shaped galaxy. And when we look at the Milky Way, we are looking through our galaxy. So we're just seeing all these stars. He sees that in his telescope. He writes it down, he draws pictures. Um, he looked at the moon. And of course, do you need a telescope to see the moon? No. But he is able to make detailed drawings of the moon. This is one of his drawings. So he makes detailed drawings of the surface of the moon. Um, famously, what we now know to be craters on the moon, he assumed to be what? Do you know this? This is a famous thing. Um, for example, I don't know if there's any Apollo nuts here. I'm an Apollo nut, but the Apollo 11 mission was the first mission to land on the moon, and they land on Mare Tranquil. Oh gosh, I should know how this is spelled, but I don't. But anyway, Eris maybe? Don't quote me on that, I'm guessing. That's just a guess. I'm just going to get really squiggly, and then you won't know what I wrote. But they landed on a crater, in a crater in the moon 
that is known as the Mare is Italian or Latin for sea, the sea of tranquility. He saw all these dark patches on the moon, and what did he think he was looking at? Water. Yeah, he thought he was looking at water on the moon. He isn't, they're just craters. There is some water on the moon, but not enough to make oceans or rivers or things like that. There's little bits of frozen ice on the moon. But he thought that he was looking at seas. But he was able to see all this detail on the moon. And he sketched it. He drew it. He wrote about it. Pretty cool stuff. And then comes what I think is the most exciting thing. Galileo sees. This is all pretty cool. But eventually he is able to point his telescope at the planets. And of course, if you point a telescope at a star, it still just stays a point of light. It still just get a dot. All right. Does anyone look at anyone, have, anyone ever look through a telescope? Yeah, if you point at the stars, they still just look like stars, right? They still look like dots. But here's the crazy thing. You point your telescope at a planet, which to your eye just looks like another dot in the sky. All of a sudden, you see it open up and it's a circle and you can see the planet. So he's able to look at the planets and he's looking at Jupiter. But here's where it gets really cool. While observing Jupiter, Our pal Galileo discovered four moons. Ooh, the less common spelling of discovered without a second E. Discovered four moons. And these are commonly known as the Jovian moons. Jovian just means of Jupiter. And, oh gosh, oh, I forgot to write the names down. Okay, ooh, ooh, can I do this from memory? I don't think so. I think I'm just going to Google it. Um, I know there's Eo, Europa, and Callisto, but I'm not sure which is which. That's so embarrassing. I didn't put it on my cheat sheet. I always put these things on my cheat sheet. Okay. Uh, okay, well, that's definitely Europa. Hey, okay, we loaded. That is Eo. And then is that Callisto or is that Callisto? Uh, that is Callisto. And that means this must be Ganymede. Oh boy, can somebody do a spelling check on Ganymede for me? Is it G-A-N-Y-M-E-D-E? -E? Not that you have to know these. Yeah. Listen, I am never going to care that you know the four Jovian moons that uh, Galileo discovered. Yep. Did they name Europa after Euro? Yeah. Yeah, and listen, you know, if you're a guy who discovers moons, you get to name them too. I don't know where all the name where all the names come from. Um, I imagine mythology for a lot of them, but yeah, Europa is named in honor of Europe. So, how crazy to be looking at what just seemed to be a point of light, only to discover that not only is that point of light a planet, but that planet actually has its own moons. He could see these revolving around them. Now, we now know that Jupiter has many, many more moons. These are just the biggest ones. Jupiter's got a ton of moons. Jupiter's a big planet. Like we said, it's almost big enough to be its own star. Um, but these guys, observable by him. Again, I am not trying to tell you every piece of discovery that happened along the way. That, I mean, we spend months doing that. I'm just trying to give you a taste of throughout history how it is we learned about this. Galileo famously, in his books where he presented this, agreed with our buddy Copernicus. He said, yeah, you know, the Earth is in the center of the universe, and I can prove it. Like, I can show you all these things going around. Um, he was famously arrested for publishing this. Could you still find those books there? Would they be like notebooks or published like that? Yeah, they still exist. Okay. They still exist. I mean, you can find published versions of them, but his originals, if I'm not mistaken, still exist. Let me look into that. I'm not sure. I know that Divin I know that by Enlightenment times, these notebooks survive. Galileo's may have been destroyed. I'll have to look into that. I'm not sure. Because he was very controversial. Yeah. He was actually arrested by the Catholic Church. He was Roman, and sort of where he lived in Italy was dominated by the Catholic Church. And like we said... Bad science has a way of hanging on. They didn't like what he was publishing. He was arrested. He was forced to, on threat of being put to death, to recant and say that everything he said wasn't true, which he did. And listen, I'd do that too. If they were going to kill me, I'd be like, sure, the sky's red. Let's go. 
Red sky, nice sky. Okay, don't kill me. So Galileo does. He says, sure, yeah, whatever, okay. It was the center of the universe. Don't care. But it was a dangerous time to question authority. We should always question authority. But that doesn't mean just being cynically disbelieving. It means thinking how Galileo thinks, which is using the best evidence we have, looking at the people who've come before us who know the most, how can we expand on it? It's not about blowing up and saying, I think the opposite of what everyone else thinks. It's about building on the best knowledge we have. I think that's what we miss. Sometimes we look at these rebels in history and we think, oh, you know, what I need to do is disagree with the establishment. No. The truth is Galileo was agreeing with the scientific establishment. He was disagreeing with, you know, he was disagreeing with the cultural establishment. That's very different. Very different. Um, I won't get too much into it. I'm going to mention one more guy, and I just like the next guy because Kepler famously uh, lost his nose in a knife fight with somebody who disagreed with him about one of his mathematical equations. And that's my kind of guy. Did they both have an eye, or was it just him getting... You know, I don't know. But, but what I do know is Kepler and Tycho Brahe uh, were two guys. Uh, they were Dutch. I think they're Dutch. Don't quote me on that. Um, but they were, uh, they were the kind of the bad boys of science at the time. Look at this thing. I don't know what you call these ruffles, but I want to bring it back. I want to bring that back. I think I would look good. Hmm. But... Kepler is a major figure in astronomy, and he didn't make observations himself. He wasn't an astronomer. He didn't, yeah? I'm pretty sure the name of the other guy, Tycho, was mentioned in Space Odyssey. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, what's named after, is it the... It's the name of one of the aliens, but also like a part of the moon, I think. It's the name of the moon base, isn't it? In 2001? Yeah. I think that it's the name, don't quote me on that, yeah. The caller is called a rough. A rough. I'd look good in a rough. That's what I think. That's it. Monday, next time, next block of science, you're going to be like, what's different about Orlando? Oh, it's the rough. And I'm going to get those things too, like the little, the, the, the compass. And I'm just going to stand there all, you know, get my beard longer. Oh, you would look terrible. I would look good. Okay. Anyway, now I have a goal. But so, I, this is just one more thing I like to mention. And I mentioned Kepler because I think this is cool. Kepler himself didn't look through a telescope. He didn't run a, a, run a lab. He wasn't an astronomer. I like him because he's just a math guy. And I think this is exciting about science too because science is all about taking what you're good at and using it to help other people's discoveries. So there's a different guy, a guy named Tycho Brahe, and Tycho was an astronomer. He just looked through telescopes and he looked up at the sky and he just kept incredibly detailed notes. On this night at this time, this star was here. This planet was here. He just had incredibly detailed notes about where everything was in the sky, when it was. And Kepler goes, hey, I could use that. And he takes these numbers and he is the guy who figures out the mathematical laws that control how the planets orbit. So I'm not going to get into those laws. He has three basic laws, and they're, they're pretty cool. But he uses someone else's observations to create mathematical formulae, to create formulas or math equations. that explain the motion of the planets. He's the one that discovers that they don't orbit in circles, but they orbit in ellipses. Um, he's the one who discovers that the further away from the sun, the longer, it t you know, the longer a year is. Um, he's the one who figures out that, uh, you know, in this part of the orbit, the planet is moving slower and here it's moving faster. He figures out all these things, and he does it just using somebody else's observations. And again, I don't want to get too much into it. You aren't expected to memorize any of this, but rather I just want to show there's so many different types of people who make great scientists. From this guy who is just a mathematician who looks at other people's numbers, to Galileo who really is an inventor and like a polymath and loves to build things and loves to try a million different things and was sort of a jack of all trades. You know, he was studying the stars, but he was also studying gravity, and he was a builder and an inventor. To someone like Copernicus, who was very much an optics guy, right? Like, loved looking up at the sky. 
all sorts of different people make their own unique and interesting contributions to science. And I love that because science is such a big field that it needs all kinds of thinkers from artists and creative types to builders who can make things to mathematicians who can interpret things to great speakers who can communicate information. It's all an important part of science. And I love that. So that's all I'm going to go through for this. There's no assignment for this. You don't have to have any of this information memorized. To be honest, normally in a class like this, there'd be a unit test and you'd have to be like, fill in the blank multiple choice. And in a way, I'm not sad to see that go. That's one thing about COVID I don't mind, is who cares? It doesn't really matter that you know what four moons Galileo discovered. What's important is that you understand that science is about curiosity and looking at the world around you and saying, what can this teach me? What can I learn from this? And that it doesn't come from a place of arrogance saying, I'll, I'll prove what everyone else is saying wrong. It's actually the exact opposite. It's what information do we already have and what little sliver can I add to it? With that in mind, I'm going to show you what your task for this last lesson is. I just want you to make me a poster. Posters are fun. Try something different. You can make it in whatever you want. You want to make it in Photoshop, make it in Photoshop. You want to make it in, what's the drawing program you said you use? Oh, uh, Procreate. Yeah. You know this I don't. <laughs> That's okay. You want to use that? Use that. If you want to use uh, you know, PowerPoint or Google Slides and just make it one sheet, that's fine. Whatever you want. I want you to make me a poster, and I want you to pick a, a, a scientific discovery in space. And if we can go into teams, I gave you a list of some to, tr to think about, but you can come up with your own. I don't really care what it is. Um, oh, that's my math class. You don't want to do math work, do you? But so here it's called History of Discovery Project. And just, just to give you the student view, just to show you what you'll see, for this... Um, there's just a bunch of different topics and I just want you to make a poster and just tell me about um, some discovery or some major event in our understanding of space. Tell me who made it, when did it happen, how did it happen, what impact did it have on research, and I've just thrown a few ideas out there. Um, you could do the Big Bang. Excuse the interruption. Yeah. Uh, do you have Adrian Kelter with you? No. No. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, you could do uh, Pythagoras um, and discovering that the Earth is round, or Aristarchus, the ones we've done. You could do uh, the first accurate star map we know of, Hipparchus. He probably didn't do the first, but he's the first one that we still have today. Um, you could do all those things we've talked about here, but you could say, well, wait a minute, we learned about those HR diagrams that tell us about how brightness versus how... You could tell me about him. How do you come up with that? You could tell me about the first thing a human ever launched into space. Does anyone know what that is? Sputnik. It was a Russian probe about the size of a beach ball. It was the first thing humans ever shot out of Earth and into orbit. Yeah. Didn't Russians also send a poor innocent dog to space? They did. The Americans preferred to send monkeys, but you know, we both, before we sent people, we sent animals. It's often how things get done. Um, you could tell me about Yuri Gagarin. He was the first man in space. You could tell me about Valentina Tereshkova. She was the first woman in space. The Russians got a woman in space in 1962. I think it took the Americans till 1981. Sally Ride, first, uh, who had a pretty amazing name for an astronaut. Um, but Valentina Tereshkova, not only the first woman in space, she famously was the first person to ever skydive out of the capsule as it was coming in. The Russians tried a different thing where instead of having the parachute on the capsule, they would have the parachute on the astronaut, and on the way down, she would just open the door and jump out, which she did. Pretty badass. You could learn about it. Um, oh. You could learn about the Apollo 1 disaster. Um, oh, that says Jake Patterson. He wasn't the disaster. He's just the person who signed up for this last year, and I accidentally didn't erase his name. Um, you could learn about Apollo 11, first walk on the moon, or Apollo 13. Maybe you want to tell me about the Hubble telescope or the space shuttle. Maybe you want to tell me about recent stuff. Gravity waves were just discovered for the first time. We just photographed a black hole. You could tell me about SpaceX, which I think is a pretty incredible thing. So you can pick a topic. And if you don't see it on there, this is not an exhaustive list. You have another idea, blow it by me and let me know. But your last task for this is I just want you to tell me about a famous discovery and how we learned about it and what impact it had. And I want you to make me a poster about it. And make it pretty. Does that make sense? All right, I'm going to be quiet then. Yeah. <coughs>